All right, everyone. You've been listening. You've been waiting. And now the big Rent Ready reveal can finally come to light. Rent Ready just launched rental property accounting for all landlords. Now you can easily connect your rental properties from Rent Ready to an accounting software created specifically for landlords with Rent Ready's newest partner, REI Hub. Hmm. So essentially with this, you can automatically transfer properties and charges from your Rent Ready profile. You can track your income and expenses with matching rules and payment templates to speed up your bookkeeping. View your profit and loss cash flow statements by property or unit and get your portfolio's balance sheet, schedule ease, and more. It would be so cool to get this all in one place too. This We've been doing this on the side. Imagine yeah. having this all in one REI hub. Love it. Like that play. So uh, this is something we definitely can use and we will be using. Um, so without further ado, obviously listeners, we are very excited about this and there's something a little bit more exciting. We more have More exciting way, than that? Yeah, way more. <laughs> we can hook up our listeners. So with that, if you're currently not using Rent Ready, you can sign up using our special code JUICEPOD and get 50% off your Rent Ready subscription. Once you set up your properties, you can add rental properties accounting as a premium feature. If you're currently using Rent Ready, go check out the new accounting features designed to save you time and money while you manage your business. So whether you don't have Rent Ready or you do, you have access to this feature, Make sure to use our code JUICEPOD, that's J-U-I-C-E-P-O-D to get your access. And that is found on rentready.com, R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com. If this is your first time here, welcome. During our shows, we interview successful entrepreneurs and investors to spread knowledge, advice, and actionable tactics to help others in the pursuit of financial freedom. We discuss successes, failures, systems, motivations, experiences, and key lessons learned along the way in the hopes that these stories help you along your journey. Tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice. If you've been here before and like what you've been hearing, please subscribe, share with friends, rate and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes an extremely long way for us. It's simple. Just click on your podcast app, type in our podcast name, The Weekly Juice, click on the reviews and let us know what you think. The more ratings we get, the more eyes we'll get in our show and in turn, we'll be able to provide you all with high quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod for daily content and personal finance tips to assist in your journey towards financial freedom. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today we had on special guest Ian Group, also known as Ian Builds Wealth on All Social. He is a former real estate attorney turned tech startup executive that has a passion for teaching others how to build wealth and live life on their own terms. He shares a lot about paying off debt and getting your financial house in order on his social media. And it's just been an excellent conversation and went in a lot of different directions. We talked about real estate, we talked about stocks, cryptocurrency, paying off debt, and just pretty much getting your whole financial house in place. Yeah. I don't know if you, did you mention this, that he paid off oh, almost $170,000 worth of debt, which is amazing because he had debt from student loans and then he paid off credit card debt as well. Uh, but we don't talk a, a ton about the real estate in this episode, but we do talk a lot about like how to build a stock portfolio and also get a little bit into crypto, NFT, blockchain, and just like what the future is talking about the metaverse um, with Facebook and all those changes and just giving people a good idea of what is to come. So how can you stay ahead? How can you invest? How can you kind of plan for what the future is? And Ian's a really smart guy and he's, he has provides a lot of value on his Instagram page. So I think people are going to enjoy this episode. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's bring it in. All right, Ian, officially welcome to the weekly juice podcast. Corey and I are thrilled to have you on. We've been connected on social for a while now and love your story. Love what you're about and the message you're trying to trying to push. So if you could, for people that don't know you just give a little brief background on who you are, where you're from, and then how you got into the financial independence movement. Sure. And, and thanks guys for, for having me. I obviously watch all your, your content, listen to the content and we interact on Instagram. It's, it's cool to finally be face to face. Um, so my background is, um, started out my career as a real estate attorney, did that for about six years. Uh, and then pivoted my career to go work for a technology company called ProDeal. We basically built the Dropbox for real estate. Um, but that was, uh, it wasn't an easy journey to, to get to this point. I graduated law school in 2011 with about um, $190,000 of student debt that ballooned 
to about 210,000 uh, due to some mistakes I made with um, forbearances. And um, I had some credit card debt on top of that. So um, it was a bit of a rocky start to my journey to, uh, to get where I am. The debt is, is not fully paid off. I'm still working on it, but I've paid off. I think I, my, I, my balance now is about 58,000 bucks. So knocked off a ton of that. And no, I don't have credit card debt at all. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the background. And, um, I met my wife in 2012. I came to the relationship with a ton of debt. She came with savings and a good, uh, money mindset, <laughs> save for the future. My, if you talk to my father-in-law now, he talks about, uh, the ripple effect of all the decisions you make. And when I, uh, when I got exposed to that, I realized there was a much better way to do things, to actually take ownership. And uh, it was a, a big turnaround for me, but, but that's why I'm, I'm out there because I'm, uh, I'm trying to talk to, to myself five or 10 years ago to say to people, hey, uh, you didn't miss the boat. You can, you can correct course. And there's just simple steps to take to, to actually get there. It's not rocket science. Ian, one of the things I find really interesting, and thanks for sharing the story, is that you, you know, being in that much debt, it, a lot of people can go into a shell and kind of be just like, oh, shit, it's going to take me forever to get out of this. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to deal with it. I don't want to face it. And I definitely don't want to talk about it. But for you to meet your wife and then be, you know, kind of uh, brought into this money talking situation where you felt more comfortable about it. What about your journey has allowed you to like become the voice of paying off debt? Because, uh, because it's difficult to, to just go into a situation and be like, oh, I have all this debt, but now I want to talk, teach other people how to pay it off. Like, why did you decide to take, have a voice behind it, so to speak? Um, a, f a few reasons. I think, first of all, I, I was, when I, when I, I remember when I graduated law school, so this is 2011, they did this like, they did an information session about your loans and how to pay off loans and stuff. And, and I didn't, I didn't really like, I didn't own that, that I had that much debt afterwards. I wasn't saying to myself, okay, I'm going to attack this. I'm going to plan for it. And I think part of it was that when you're in law school, you were so focused on academics. And especially when you graduate, you, you graduate law school and then you have to study for the bar exam for two months. So I think I kind of just like subconsciously pushed it to the side and like didn't care. And then I, um, when I graduated, I moved back home, found myself just kind of like angry and upset. I wish I didn't go to law school. I wish I didn't take up, take out all of this debt. And it's a bad place to be, to regret this investment that I made in myself and my future. And, um, look, I, I don't think that I am, uh, I'm different than a lot of people. I think a lot of people have a similar background to me, which is go to school, do the things that they, your parents, your, you know, mentors, whatever tell you to do to get ahead in life. But then you come out and you have to face the real world and say, wow, I, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm my own person now. What am I going to do to get on track? And I just, I, I think I have a, uh, a, a similar experience, a similar background to a lot of people where I, I can help them. I can teach them the things that I did um, to, to get on the right course, to right. achieve certain goals, build a family, to start saving for retirement. These are things a lot of people want. So I think people can identify me with, with me on all that. Absolutely. And with that, I mean, it's nothing to, to push under the rug here. You've you've paid off over $150,000 worth of debt. That's a lot. And, and that's a, I, you know, six years ish around there. Um, I'm not totally sure of your timeline, but 10, four, 10 years, I graduated 2011, 10 years. Okay, cool. Yeah. So can you give us for people that have debt right now and they're looking to get out of that and get their financial house in order, what are some mm -hmm. tips that you would give for them to put their pieces back together and start getting on the right track? It's a great question. So first of all, that 150 was just the student loan piece. I also had about 20,000 of credit card debt on top of that. So rule number one for anybody that's asking me about debt payoff is get rid of the credit card debt because that's like quicksand. It's crippling at 17 or 20, whatever percent it interest it is. It's, it's hard to get out of. <clears throat> so I would, I'd focus on credit card debt first. 
And then you have to get, you really have to get organized too. So maybe even before credit card debt is understand what you're dealing with. When you graduate with student loans, for me, I had, I don't even remember all the names. There's like the federal plus loan, the grad plus loan and the direct subsidized and the un, indirect, whatever. There's like all these different types of loans. You have to understand what you're dealing with and look at the rates. I consolidated all of those and I refinanced my loans probably four or five different times. My rate when I got out of law school was like seven or 8%. So it was hard for me. And that's why I did those forbearances. I, it was hard for me to hit the principal balance and overcome the interest for my, on my payments. So um, get organized, do what you can to refinance right now. The rates are super low. Now, if anybody's listening and they have student loans, it is a little bit of a risk to refinance from student debt to a private loan because you lose some of the protections. Like right now the government has a, a forbearance on loans. I believe that things will start up again soon, but, um, they're no longer student loans. They're private loans. Can Benefit you, to, sorry, not to cut you off. Can you give yeah. um, an example of what you did for forbearance? Like I'm sure people don't even know what um, that word means. For a forbearance, the way people know it right now is during COVID, the government allowed people to forbear on their loans, basically just stops payments. But in my case, I did it back in 20, I think 2011 or 2012. Where, like I said, I wasn't. I had a very low salary. I was doing a clerkship, which, for anybody that doesn't know, you basically go work for judges and help them with research. So I did that for a year, and I had a very low salary. The uh, interest on my loans far exceeded what I could even pay. Right, so I just figured, okay, I need to write the ship here. I'm going to take a little bit of time to like put together some money. I did a forbearance, which stopped my payments, but the interest kept accruing, and when the interest when the forbearance period ends, they take whatever interest that accrues over those several months and they put it into the principal balance. So now your total balance, the principal balance is higher. And I did that two times. So my caused my principal balance to elevate to like 210,000 bucks. And Ian, what you're talking about, the difference is right now with COVID is that I think uh, um, I didn't, my student loans, I have a, stu a small amount of student loans that are government student loans, and we got put in a forbearance program automatically. But I think right. the difference that you're talking about is that there was actually no interest accrued based on this COVID situation, right? Is that, is that correct? To your yeah, mind? correct. To my, to my knowledge, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the interest is not accruing and you're not going to be penalized for this totally one, once in a lifetime you know, uh, yeah. event. Let's talk about the difference then here, where you were, go back a little bit to you, what happens when you refinance from student loans, maybe government student loans to private and what the difference is and kind of what you see happening, because I think it's really important for people to know. Um, I know that there's a, a number of people that I know that are in a government payoff program where yep. uh, the loans are forgiven over a certain period of Correct. time. And if you refinance, then that forgiveness program, that forgiveness program goes away. Um, so can you talk yeah. to that a little bit? Sure. When you're paying off a government loan, there are several different repayment options. You have income-based repayment. There's public service loan forgiveness. Those are all government programs to help people pay back their student loans. But as you just said, if you refi with a private loan, that all of that goes away. And that, re, that, that uh, private loan becomes like a mortgage almost. You don't get the option to just say, hey, I can't pay my mortgage. I need a forbearance on my loans they're, they're, you're required to pay it. I mean, there's no, there's no options like you have with government loans, right? So once you refinance as a private loan, you basically consolidate all that debt. Um, they amortize it over a, I think mine was like a 20 or 30 year period. I think I actually, I think it was maybe 15 years because yeah, a lot of times I'm I pretty close 10, to 10, 20. Yeah. Yeah. So I think mine was 15 years cause I'm, I'm pretty close to having it all paid off. Uh, but that's it. Your payments are due every month. I refinanced with a bank. So I have an account there. I have direct deposit. My money goes in, they take it out. Done. Got it. So I, I think that, thank you for, for kind of uh, talking about that, because I think that a lot of people that are looking to refi don't realize that there's actually some negative connotations that come along with refinancing. Totally. Although if you can refinance from a 7% interest rate to a 3% interest rate, like most of the time you're going to win by doing that. So thank Definitely. you for bringing that up. I think the next thing that we want to talk about is like, 
paying off the debt and doing what you're doing and then also investing and what you're, what you're, idea is like, do you invest while you're paying off debt? Some people say that they do. Some people will say they don't. For me, I have a small amount of debt. So investing for me was like a no brainer. Like if you're investing in the last 10 years, you're, you're in the stock market alone, you're winning. Right. So why yeah. wait? But what's your, what's your um, kind of take on that? I mean, my, so when, okay, I'll just, I'll go back a little bit. When I had that clerkship and I had a low salary, um, I was not investing. I'm pretty sure I was not investing. Maybe like a couple bucks here and there. That was like when Facebook went public. And I remember putting a couple dollars in. Uh, into ah, it should I put then, a couple whatever. more? <laughs> I, 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 if we want to talk about mistakes, I, I sold it. I mean, I, that that is also how I've come to have a much more long-term vision about how I invest because anything I've ever sold has just skyrocketed. So uh, short aside. Um I left my clerkship. It was over just a one year term. And then I got a job, basically my salary doubled. So now I had a little bit more money, um, still had the loans, still was in the process of, re- of figuring out refinancing. Uh, it wasn't until I moved from that first law firm I was at to my second law firm. I it was a big law firm. I was making big law salary, which is a substantial amount of money every year. Now I had money coming in. I had at that point refinanced my loans. So I was on a payment plan and I had a fixed cost every month. So I basically just said, okay, this, this is what I'm paying for my loans. Now I have some discretionary income where I can put that towards investing or I could pay off more of my loans. My decision, because I had a low interest rate at that point was I'm going to start investing my money. And I'm going to start to put it in some stocks. I put money, my, my employer had like a small match on a 401k. So I was doing that. Uh, my opinion is if, if you're not, if you're paying off a student loan and the rates are low or even mortgage and the rates are low, I personally believe in investing for your future. If you're paying off credit card debt, I, I would say don't invest, pay off that debt first, because it's very difficult for you to overcome that credit card debt with whatever returns you're going to make in the market. Just as I don't think it makes sense. Got it. Got it. I'm curious uh, because you had kind of a, you had to have a tight budget when you're paying off all this debt, right? I mean, you have to kind of know where your money's going and which buckets they're going into. I mean, Mm -hmm. do you have any tips or budgeting tips or trackers or something that you used as you were going through this journey of paying off, you know, 150 plus thousand dollars of debt in, in that timeframe that you did? My budget has evolved substantially over time. So I, I used, back then I used two things. I used a budget, which tracked, generally tracked what I would spend every month in different categories. And I've refined it down to eight categories, which include a lot of which is fixed costs. Most of those fixed costs cover are under living expenses. But really the, the way I structure my budget is to highlight the variable costs that I know can uh, cause some trouble or, or, or take me off track. So groceries, food, I, now I have a family of four. So I'm, you know, food costs are, are up dining out, which is a big one. When I was living in New York city, dining out, going to get drinks after work, whatever that can crush your budget and shopping. I like sneakers, I like clothes. And so, you know, you see stuff on Instagram or online or whatever that's that for those are the three areas for me that were always kind of, I'll call them uh, trouble areas. So I always was tracking generally those areas. And then I had a, a like this Excel spreadsheet where I was literally entering in my expenses every, I almost had it open on my, my computer every day. Kind of like if I had expenses, like I paid off a credit card or whatever, I'd put that on there and I would have a running total of my bank balance so I could see four or five months down the road, what the impact of those expenses would be. Now I just automate all of that in an app called Copilot that I use. But if Copilot. you want my budget, my budget is actually available for free. Literally link in my bio, bio takes you right to my budget. So that's the budget I use. Cool. That's awesome. Sweet. I know a lot of people use Copilot's a good shout out. Um, people use I've Mint. actually never heard of Copilot. I, will, uh, I love Mint. Yeah. I was just going to say for Copilot, is it more so, does it track your net worth or is it all just like budget expense income and outflow essentially of, of what you're spending each month? Um, it can track your net worth for me. I'm just using it to track my expenses. 
And what's cool that I did was I actually, you can, so it basically takes in all of your expenses when you link it to your credit cards or whatever you have your bank accounts and it categorizes them. I categorize everything in my eight budget categories. So literally any expense that comes into Copilot goes into one of my eight categories. And so I just posted a reel on this. It was, it was sponsored by Copilot. Um, but you'll see that at the end of the month, I know exactly where I'm at in all of my categories in my budget. So I know how much I spent on groceries and I can see, is that lining up with the amounts that I've designated in my budget uh, that I should be spending? Awesome. Love that. It's a good, good shout out and people give it a try. Um, so question for you too, is uh, it's more so looking down the line. Do you have a financial, like a fine number that you want to hit in order to reach retirement? And then what, maybe that's a number or, and do you have an age attached with like, Hey, I want to be done just with the, uh, the nine to five life. I have a general fine number. Um, I actually have it right here. I, so in my fine number, I, just vastly overestimated my expenses. But, and I have two kids, by the way. So I figured like, okay, I'm paying for private schools or college. And my wife and I have this, have a long-term goal. We live, so we live in South Florida. One of our goals is to have an apartment in New York city. That's where I'm from. We would love to have that apartment where we could go up and see family, go to Broadway shows and just have that as like our base over there. So, so yeah, I have a fine number that kind of includes all of these lavish things that we would love to have in life. I don't have a specific retirement age. I love to work and I don't know that I would ever retire per se. I would love to get to a point where I don't have to rely on being at a, a company to cover a nine to five salary or have uh, health benefits. So if I can get out from that and do my own thing, then that that's kind of the the goal. Cool. Um, I appreciate that. And, and I also, we can tell you like to work You're you're also on Instagram, just pumping out content, helping other people. And like, it's just like energizer bunny, right? You keep going. The, yeah. the question I have for you too is, is about your work. And I know you talked about you were a real estate attorney for, uh, I think it was six years and then you left mm -hmm. it for a tech startup and it's, it's in the real estate world. We talk a lot about real estate in our podcast. And I think a lot of our listeners are real. That's one of their investment strategies. So they probably want to hear a little bit more about that. Can you talk about the difference between, you know, your life as a real estate attorney, what you actually were doing, and then the transition on why you left and what you do currently with your, uh, the tech startup. And I know you said it's like the Dropbox for, for real estate, right? That's, yeah. that's intriguing. I want to, maybe we can take advantage of that product system as well. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about all that. And this is something I'm so passionate about because uh, like I said, I, I spent three years in law school with a, a huge amount of loans that, that came out of it. That's a massive investment in, uh, in your future. Right. And so the, the six years I spent practicing law were kind of fueled by that investment had I not done that, I wouldn't be where I am today to, uh, to be at this technology company. I'll, I'll explain why in a second. I, I really got a tremendous amount of experience as a lawyer and I learned an incredible amount, uh, about real estate. I, you know, I say, I, I've, I've, I've said I've closed over a billion dollars of, of transactions, but it's, it's way more than that. I've worked on some massive, massive deals. Um, but I knew deep down, it wasn't always where I wanted to be full-time in life. Being a lawyer is, it's a grind. It's a tough job. Uh, it requires a lot of late hours and it's a lot of uh, contract review and drafting and you're in the service industry. So you have to service your clients. So there came a point, this was the, um, the end of 2017. My son was just born in, in October and I decided, you know what, I'm going to start to look around and see what else is out there. And was thinking about maybe going in-house. When you say in-house, it's just going to work for like a real estate company as an in-house lawyer. But then uh, I had lunch with a buddy of mine and his boss. And they start telling me about this tech company that he started. Now, this guy, um, he is in the title insurance industry, but not like title that you get for a, a house commercial title, massive, massive deals. And he is an incredible salesman. He is an incredible marketer. And he had this idea to basically build a platform that 
made it easier to distribute title on transactions. He built a prototype, hired a couple people to work there, and then found that this had a greater applicability because when you're closing a large commercial transaction, just think about it on the residential side, think of all the financial statements that you need to get to, uh, to the bank if you're getting a mortgage all the due diligence that the mortgage that the mortgage lender needs on you to ultimately give you that loan. Now imagine this on a commercial transaction. On a big building, you need rent rolls, environmental reports, surveys, zoning. There's tons of stuff, right? I was reviewing all of these things as a lawyer. So I knew the pain points that people were going through to try to track all of this with a checklist, with uh, sometimes a data room like Dropbox and a PDF uh, and, and, a, um, and a whole lot of emails, right? So I see this platform and immediate, immediately for me, it clicks. And I know I have an edge in this space because I just spent six years doing this. So I went to go meet the, uh, the guy that was running the company. And I said to him, look, I'm kind of in the market for something new. Um, you guys looking to hire and the rest is history. Awesome. That's really cool. And can you just explain a little bit, a little bit more detail about the actual product? Cause I think, um, totally. I, it sounds like something that you were mentioning, right? That like we would actually use because going through the closing process, I mean, the amount of paperwork is yeah. it's unbelievable. And like it's where crazy. the tracking all these documents and like we've created folders for ourselves, but it sounds like we can eliminate that by maybe using a product like, like yours. Most people are using Dropbox to house everything. We basically took the con that concept of a, of a cloud-based data room and married that with a checklist. So you have an, uh, a nice little dashboard, you log in, you can see rooms for all of your deals. You click into the room and it literally looks like a checklist. Within that checklist, you can communicate back and forth with people, you could set due dates, you can assign responsibility. And that's what it is. It's literally purpose built for transactions. Awesome, very, very, very cool. I think um, it's something that we'll have to check out and it sounds like uh, it's, it's pretty useful in the market. So very cool, thanks for sharing it, appreciate it. Um, the of course, kind of the next segment of the pro deal, by the way, There's pro deal. The yeah. We didn't even <laughs> check out that. the mug. Yeah. I love that pro deal. Awesome. So shout out to, uh, to pro deal. Hopefully you can, uh, if you're listening, take a look at it. Sounds like it's pretty cool. Um, so I guess the transition here a little bit into your investment portfolio, I know yeah. that you have a stock portfolio, a little bit of crypto as well, which mm -hmm. we haven't talked too much about on our podcast with a lot of our guests. So can you talk about what your current investment portfolio looks like? And maybe like, if you're willing to share where you're allocated and what advice you'd have for people that are, whether or not they're paying off debt, they're starting to invest. And there's, it's a necessity in our eyes now to invest. It's not just like, this yeah. is how you get wealthy. It's like, this is how you not only get wealthy, but just stay ahead of, of inflation. inflation. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Totally. So um, just as a disclaimer for me, because I, because I am a lawyer, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, none of this is investment advice, or I, I, mean, I also have to say, you know, it's not, shouldn't be considered as legal advice or, or whatever, all the mumbo jumbo. But in terms of, of how I look at things, I, I like to kind of cast my net broadly, um, and think really long-term. So that's why I like, um, index funds that, you know, basically track the S and P 500, the total stock market index is great. I'm super bullish on things like cybersecurity, uh, mobile payments. So any ETFs that track those I've, I've been in those for, for a long time. Um, I am not too big on picking stocks. I used to be, um, and the, most of those picks have worked out pretty well. I love companies like Shopify, for example, I think They've just like made it so easy to create an online store. They're, they're unbelievable. Um, if there are companies that I really believe in, then okay, maybe I will, I'll pick up a few shares here and there. But generally speaking, I'm putting money into these low cost index funds, ETFs. Um, I do also invest in cryptocurrency. So I'm happy to, happy to talk about that a little bit if you guys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I want you to dive in. I just wanted to mention something that, that I started to do with my um, Fidelity uh, brokerage, I actually just started buying an ETF called Moto, M-O-T-O, which is uh, smart technology, trans uh, smart technology information and like electric car, a lot of to do with oh. like electric car transportation. So that okay. when you mentioned like there, I was thinking like, okay, I'm not going to try to pick the stock. I mean, Tesla right. is in this, but there's like, a, 
you know, a, a plethora of stocks that kind of are in the same ballpark. So you're talking about, you know, payment processing and stuff like that. I like, I really like that. I also like, like, what is the future? Think about broadly, what is exactly. the future of buying ETF that has, is going in that direction. So Moto is one, I just figured I would share. I literally started buying it the other day, that but let's go into some cryptocurrency because sure. I have some Bitcoin that I found. <laughs> I literally just Whoa. found it last week, $1,500 worth or so. Like, so it's not a ton, <laughs> but I didn't even know I had it because uh, it was in like a different account, but I don't even know enough about crypto to like really say what you should invest in. And we're hearing a lot of really smart people say 1.5 to 5% of their holdings are now in crypto. Do you agree with that? Was that something that you would look at Ian? Cause I'm curious genuinely for my own knowledge. I just don't know enough. I think as with any investment, you should only put as much into it as you are willing to lose. <clears throat> um, because looks, I think stocks are less likely to plummet to zero. There'd be pretty massive impl uh, implications if, if the stock market just actually plummeted, but crypto, we don't really know. We don't really know yet. Um, with crypto, I, I would say if you're looking to invest in it, you know, be prepared to lose it. And there's a lot of coins out there that I'm just not really sure what they do. So I'm, I personally like the, the bigger coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum. I think those have the best chance of, of succeeding long-term. So like that's, that's where I would focus specifically. Oh. I like this conversation too. It's it's interesting. We both just opened our Coinbase apps, and, and he's got a lot more than me, man. Holy <laughs> shit! Yeah. I had no idea. It's not that much money. It's it's about like eight thousand bucks, but it it goes up and down. I I just dude, I yeah. haven't checked it. I bought it like five years ago, and it was it was like ten percent of a Bitcoin, and uh, I don't know twenty percent of Ethereum, and then I have one Litecoin or something like that. So whatever, mm -hmm. it it just like goes up down. Like sometimes it'll be negative, yep. sometimes positive, whatever. But the more research I've been doing, I really like this conversation of uh, the metaverse. And where mm -hmm. the future is going, I don't know if you've seen the movie Ready Player One, and that, um, and then there's also another. I forget the. So there's like a newer movie. Oh, it's uh, Free Guy. I think it's with um, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, yeah. Yeah, it's just like <clears throat> similar concept, but basically, I'm just the I I kind of do see the future. If you look like the younger generation, like they're constantly on their iPads, constantly on their phones. They, I hate to say it, they're not great with building relationships. They just kind of go. <laughs> Like it's almost like a pacifier. You give your kid the iPad. So he, he's quiet and does yeah. virtual you know. reality. And so it's a yeah. virtual reality. And like you saw Facebook switch to meta and like, that's kind of where I think the future is going. Now, the, the interesting part about um, cryptocurrency is like, that is a play. It's like almost like a token, it's like to, to start buying yeah. stuff within that virtual universe, if you want to call it. The thing I'm seeing today a lot is um, things on NFTs. And the biggest, one of the biggest forms of payment is Ethereum. And I think that's just going to continue to jack up the price of Ethereum. And then obviously Bitcoin's kind of like the grandfather or whatever you call the godfather. Like it's just like the number one. It, it's kind of always has been there. I don't know if it'll go away. I think it's yeah. a realistic thing at some point for that thing to hit hundred thousand bucks. So if you have some invested into it, like whatever, but you have to be willing, like you said, you have to be willing to lose it. I just think with all like the way inflation is right now, there needs to be, people are like not trusting the dollar as much as they used to. Right. And, and like, um, I don't know. I just, I feel like there's so many different coins out there. Where it's hard to do like the, this Shiba Inu one. Like that was like a, a an insane, like one time it hit, I think someone invested like 8,000 bucks, like t a couple of years ago in it. And so like it went to a, a billion, it went to a billion. I think it was less dude. I think they had like $800 and it went to like a billion, but I think to go off what you're saying, rise, a lot of really smart people. And what we're learning is that they're, they're saying, okay, I'm not necessarily going to put all my eggs in the government of the United States basket. Right. And that because of how much we're spending money and how much we're printing money. So having hard assets and NFTs and arts and those things can be involved in that. And also block the blockchain. But all, this is why we talk about real estate too, because it's a physical asset that is not, you can't, just print more houses. You can build more houses, but it takes time. And it's all about like how many people are in the market, supply and demand, where I think that, I'm curious what your take on it is. And like, do you think it's the future in, I don't think it's going to replace the dollar, but I think that it's good to diversify because a lot of really smart people and a lot of big companies are now starting to do that. So, you know, you kind of have to, with the information, how fast it travels, you kind of got to jump on at least in your own risk tolerance to, to that trend. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I have a, I have a ton of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> first of all, 
I, this definitely is the future. There's no doubt about it. I mean, this thing has got so much momentum going for it, right? Um, now, in terms of, of, of this country and inflation, look, it's happened before. You've got a lot of smart people focusing on monetary policy in this country. And uh, we're, we're in the greatest country in the world, right? America will we'll, we'll be okay. I just think the government, if they're not already, I don't know what they're doing in terms of catching up with cryptocurrency, but if, if they were, were smart, they would really pay attention to this thing and figure out where does this fit you know, within, within this country? Because here, here's something like I've really been thinking about since Facebook changed its name to Meta. Imagine this world where everybody shows up to the metaverse to work. I mean, they can, you can have jobs and things in this virtual environment, right? It's, it's possible. And what if Facebook has their own currency that's paying everybody and um, that, what if, every, what if there's this ecosystem that everybody is a part of that's kind of outside the realm of our normal reality? If that makes any sense, I mean, I think that's kind of what they're going for. Facebook could have their own version of a cryptocurrency that people get paid in and that people use to ultimately fund their lives. I think it's horrifying, actually, if you really want to know my it's, opinion. I think, I, I think it's scary. I agree. Just because I think that there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for – we. how old did you say you were, Ian? I'm 36. 36. Okay, so you're on the edge of millennial with Ryan and I. We're yeah. 30. So like, I think like we didn't grow up with these phones, like grow up with them, but now, yeah. and not just phones, growing up. this virtual reality. Now kids are growing up with them. So there is like a place for virtual reality, replacing somebody's reality. I don't mean to get too deep, but it's just like an interesting concept. That's a little bit scary. And I yeah. just think that the world can't really run without human connection. So I hope that that stays, but there is some merit to what you're talking about, about, you know, these virtual currencies and virtual reality kind of like hosting positions and jobs and, and just kind of changing the structure of how we live. And it's, it's scary. I think, like, I think it's going to happen. I a hundred percent think it's going to happen. I just don't know if it'll be like how prevalent it'll be in, in our lifetimes. Like, or like how intense of a transition it will be, if that makes sense. Cause I, you know, technology, what doubles or goes 10 times each year, something, something crazy. Well, just, in like, five years, it's going to be like, we're not going to recognize the landscape. It, exactly. Right? So insane. if you can get in now, it's like, I just think it's, it's rather than fight against it. People are fighting against crypto. Look at crypto. Like if fight against the meta. Okay. It's going to just it, look at what they've it's done already powerful. with Facebook. Like, you know, so, and I just think of people, right? Like there's a lot of people that don't like their current reality for whatever reason. If you can go into a virtual world and be whoever you want to be, it's literally like a game a video game in real life. Like it, I just truly see that happening. And it's, you've seen in movies it's, and you know, they're like, oh, that'll never happen. But it's like, all right, holy shit. Like they're kind of onto something. You kind of see the path, right? Yeah. Exactly. I think about them. I think about the matrix and I think about Wally and what did you guys see Wally? You know, I, Wally. they're like on that spaceship and, and all the people are in their, their, their motorized chairs and they're kind of just like staring at screens all day. I mean, see, I think that I robot where <laughs> I don't want to think oh. about that. Cause like that, yeah. you know, all the AI intelligence, like I'm like, w Will Smith taught us about this, man. We can't go down this path. Time we're going to take over. But anyway, I, I, I think it's, it's not up to us. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the part of this. It's like the same thing with how we talk about buying real estate. It's like, it's where we can't control the market. So why not do what really other smart people have done and join in and not fight against upstream, like Rai saying, like, there's a place for people to make money. There's a place for you to thrive. You kind of don't have a choice almost like we're not going to beat meta just the three of us here. I hate to say it. So there's also no. uh, another interesting conversation. And I don't know that we're too privy on the information, but there's also something called the sandbox. And that's like the virtual landscape of, of meta. And people are starting to buy real estate in that within that sandbox. So that way, you know, when this thing does come to fruition, like they own a shitload of space and then they can advertise there. They can do X, Y, and Z. But what do you actually own? I don't get it. <laughs> it's a, you, so you own, it's an NFT basically. Exactly. It's like you own code that gives you a plot of land. The sandbox is just one example of a metaverse. There's also Decentraland. I actually created a Decentraland account to see what it looks like. Oh yeah. Um, I, honestly, I've, I've been playing around with it. I don't find it too entertaining. Okay. So I think there's going to be, a, I think there needs to be, and this is, I want also want to highlight something really important that I think this is happening. It's coming, but I don't, 
I wouldn't want to convey to anybody this need to, to, to get in like this sense of FOMO. Like if you don't get in right now, you're going to miss out. And that's, that goes with NFTs um, or owning tokens. I just think that I would urge everybody to watch and pay attention to this stuff because the, the market, the, the, our society is moving in that direction. So it's, it's really important that you pay attention and understand what's going on. I would say even more so than just like throwing your money at some of these coins. If you oh, want wow. to do that, fine, but, but, but at least educate yourself on what's going on, number one. Right. And don't pump all your cash into to one thing, right? If it doesn't work out, it's kind of just like, like we, we talked about with the coins, right? Like one, one to 5%. And that doesn't have to be a, a benchmark for anyone, but that's just like kind of where we're at. We're like, all right, we're going to dip our toes. We're not going to miss out. But then if right. it keep, continues in that direction, you can keep pumping money into it. Just like you pump into your investments each month. It's just kind of another tactic, but it's just yeah. so interesting to see the way the world is. It's, ex- it's exciting in a way. At first I was so against NFTs. I'm like, this is this, the dumbest thing in the world. You're going to, what if like the internet, what if, what if the power goes out? Then you don't have your thing, but I get the way it like stays on the blockchain and it's, it's minted, if you will. That's what they call it. I guess it, it's called it like, I forget the exact system it goes through, but it means it's like, it's yours unless until you sell it and then it gets minted to another person, but it's on this like blockchain, which is, so I can't even explain what the blockchain is to be honest, but it's super interesting because you go from these things that you were at tangible. I just remember back in the day of like Pokemon cards, baseball cards. And like, now you have, it can be, it's like a virtual card, right? But it's art or it could be a moment in time. I know sports teams are getting into that too. Um, you see the NBA, the the 76ers just did a massive deal with crypto.com and th- there's other teams that are, they're coming out too, which is kind of insane that the way the world is, is going that way. Um, but I will say like, kids that have grown up playing video games, including myself, it always seemed like far fetched to be able to like really like live out or become this character that you always wanted to be, or like you created on your own. Right. And Mm -hmm. you try to create your own life the way that you would want, but it's, it's hard for some people. People come from different backgrounds, different, it almost level. The point I'm making here is like, it almost like levels the playing field for people. Right. Like if you just, if you have access to this virtual world and you start at zero and you can just start your life again, it's, yeah. it's the craziest thing. And there's, I see a ton of opportunity. It's just, it's such a rabbit hole of conversation. It is. And before I, we turn into robots because I, I don't know where I, I, I <laughs> he doesn't play video games. He doesn't get it. I, no, <laughs> no, I, I, I am, I believe in the validity of it. I just have a hard time wrapping my head around it. And that's why I love real estate because I know it's like, everyone needs a place to lay their head. Everyone needs a home. I'm going to yeah. stick to that. And then also branch off a little bit, which leads me to my, to kind of the last part of our stocks and crypto conversation sure. here. Ian, I want to know, can you give people, if you're comfortable, like a lay of the landscape of your uh, investment uh, portfolio? Like, do you have a certain amount of a month that you that you dip into these investments? How is there a certain percentage that you allocate? It, it, think of it like a pie chart. If you could talk to people about this, because there's a, so many people that are in your situation that are that are in you know millennials that are working, maybe making a decent amount of money, but they're still paying off debt. And and they're like, okay, well, what does Ian do to to build wealth, right? That's that's your your tag. Ian here. So wealth. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? And maybe more granularly, like a little bit specific for us, if you if you don't mind. I I put um, money directly into my four hundred one k, so that basically just gets siphoned off my paycheck. Um, I be, I think it comes out to around five hundred bucks a paycheck. Cool. So I think that's a thousand bucks. Um, I like to try to get as close as possible to maxing that out this year. I won't, I won't quite get there, but, uh, you know, we'll see, I'll probably up it a little bit next year. Um, you can max out your 401k at about 19, five. Um, then I have two kids. So I have, um, 150 bucks per kid that automatically goes into, uh, 529 plans for them. Those are just tax-free growth, uh, college saving plans. And then I have money, um, um, that I'm allocating into a, just a savings account into cash right now, because 2022, a really big goal of mine is to invest in real estate. Cool. So I'm, I'm basically allocating money into retirement, kids, future cash now so that I can have money for a down payment. If I wasn't putting it in cash, then I would probably just be putting it into my brokerage and, and, you know, investing it into some like ETFs that I like. Very cool. Very cool. I think as we start to wind down the show, we can move into the core four here. Yeah. And, um, I like that name. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> All right, 83rd episode of the core four. So, um, <laughs> um, and as the core four, we kind of get to know you. We've definitely got to know you personally. We've asked a lot of cool questions, but I want to get to know you a little bit deeper, maybe what makes you tick, kind of some yeah. personal thoughts here and, and what's helped you along your journey. So the first question would be, what is your favorite investing or business book, maybe book that helped you pay off debt um, that you would recommend for people? Um, I, I think it's a little cliche, but the book that really got me understanding all of the, uh, the power of owning assets is rich dad, poor dad. Um, so I think I'm sure a lot of people come on and say that, but I will also tell you this, a book that I'm, I'm listening to on audible right now. It's called you are the placebo by Joe Dispenza. Uh, shout out to, uh, Leandra Peters, female in finance. She was the one who told me to listen to this. Um, I, I love everything on mindset. And I think that the brain is so, so much more powerful than we know. And um, when you can harness your mind to help you achieve your goals, um, you can visualize in the negative. We all do it. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough money. I don't know enough. If you can visualize that way, you can also visualize in the positive and really gain that confidence and, and, and gain the, uh, the tools you need to, to stick with any plan that you put in place. So I, I would check that book out. It's super interesting. Cool. I, I think it's interesting that our mind automatically goes to the negative because it's, it can powerfully drive people in the wrong direction. And I don't know why that is. I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't even know if that's who would be studying that, but like our brain always does kind of like go to the negative and if it, go, and if yep. it can take you negatively in such a, into such a place, why could it not in the reverse, what you're talking about, take you to such a positive place. And I think it could, but it just takes some training. And, uh, I think that's, a. will definitely want to check that book out. So it's a, good, well, uh, a lot good of the negative. Well, thank you. A lot of the negativity is just our brain trying to protect ourselves. Um, I've worked, I work really close to, I, I actually have inflammatory bowel disease. We're, we're in the, uh, the part of getting to know each other more deep. We're, yeah, we're deep. So like, we're deep. <laughs> we're deep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I have what's called Crohn's disease. It's an, it's an inflammation of my, my, um, intestines and, um, you know, I, I take like medication and everything is good. I, my disease is in remission. Like I'm super healthy. Um, but I work with a nutritionist who's also taught me a lot about mindset, um, because, a lot of the way we feel has to do with our brain and our brain basically creates certain patterns to try to keep us safe. And so when we look at investing, you know, you hear a lot of people say just start, but it's not that easy because if you haven't been investing and you've been putting your money, just spending it in whatever fashion on, on things, maybe your vice is like spending money on expensive clothes, like that's what is safe to you. So how do you overcome that? Your brain literally has um, like neurons and pathways that have developed to understand, okay, I spend that money. It makes me feel good. And that's that feedback loop that you're constantly getting. So to actually change that part of you, your brain literally has to create new pathways. And that's hard. That creates like withdrawal symptoms. I'm actually going through this right now with my four-year-old because he's so used to at nighttime we would put him to bed and for a long time, we would give in to him, him saying, Hey, I want another book. I want something else. And we would do that to try to appease him. But now we've cut that off. We're saying two books in bed. He's freaking out. I, I find this conversation so interesting, Ian, because we're not typically, you don't treat the brain like a muscle, but it really is. I mean, have you ever totally. seen a marathon runner try to power lift? Like, <laughs> they're not going to do it right away. Right. But I've seen no. the transformation of somebody who's a marathon runner over a two or three year time frame become that or vice versa, or whatever you want to do. I think that it's, we're not treating the brain like a muscle. And when you feed you it junk and you feed it shit, you're going to get shit in shit out. And I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's really powerful. And we talk about mindset as like this overarching, just like cloud in the sky that people you got, you can't really grasp the, uh, the concept, but like when you really dig deep into that, it's just, it's unbelievable how powerful it can be once you kind of, you know, step foot after foot and on the right path with it, just like any muscle that you would train and working out or whatever. So people, you can literally make yourself sick by overthinking about, Oh something. my God. Yeah. Like you, totally. think you like have something going on and you just like yep. start feeling ill. It's the weirdest thing. Um, it's and then placebo effect. Exactly. Yeah. 
So that's a, that's a good shout out to that book. Um, definitely gonna take a look at it. Um, okay. Second question of the core four is what has been your biggest mistake that you've made along your ingest, your, your investing journey and what have you learned from it? Now uh, yours could be in your debt payoff journey. It doesn't have to be investing in general, but just like a mistake that you've overcome and, and how you've overcome that. I think the, the biggest mistake was early on with my student loans, taking those forbearances and not really owning my debt and my, my finances early on. And I overcame it just by refinancing my loans, putting a budget together, understanding my spending, and then ultimately just sticking to that. I, I, this is not like a short uh, time period debt payoff story. I didn't pay off six figures in two years. This is a 10 year process. This is a 10 years to, I wouldn't even say correct those mistakes. It's, this is 10 years of, of consistent hard work. So I did have some mistakes along the way. The way I, uh, I, I changed those mistakes or fixed them was just kind of owning up to it and getting organized. Um, so it's on the debt side. And on the investing side, mistakes that I made were buying stocks that I really loved and, and trading them, thinking I could make a quick profit. I, I just, I don't like that. If you believe in something like we talked about earlier, if you believe in the future of mobile payments or cybersecurity or even the metaverse, bet on it, bet on it long-term. I think that's a good point, Ian, because we kind of equate that to buying long-term, buy and hold rental properties versus flipping, where it's like flipping and trading could be a great way for you to bring an influx of cash, but it's not investing at all. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's you working every day for every hour and every dollar that you earn, that does not mean that you cannot make a lot of money doing it, but you have to show up every day to do so. Whereas yeah. if you're buying long-term buy and hold, you may be taking a little bit less profit, but over the long-term and compounding does its magic, you're going to end up becoming more uh, savvy and also potentially more financially free. So love that comparison. Um, great. So we're at the question three here and we're curious what you would do with some influx of cash here. Let's say that you were handed $50,000 of cash right now one time, not like recurring, but like one time, $50,000 in cash. What would you do with that money? Crypto investments, would you buy a car? Would you put a down payment on real estate? Like what would, what would you do based on how you see the landscape of your life and also just kind of like the market? Um, right now, real estate. I'd put it in real estate because that's what I'm saving up for. I mean, the reason I'm not sinking all my money into my debt payoff is because I'm, I'm on a plan. Right, I have that fixed cost allocated for my budget. Um, I know what I need to pay every month. My interest rate is relatively low, and I I already see the end in sight. And the thing is that it doesn't bother me. I did a I did a live the other night with um, uh, Brennan Budget Dog. Yeah, and and somebody was asking, do I invest or do I uh, pay off my debt? And he, right, he, the first question was the interest rates. Second was does it does it bug you? I thought that was, that was great. The debt, my, my student loans don't bug me anymore. So if they did, I under I, control. they're under control. Right. Um, so for me, real estate, the, the, I think the market is, is super hot right now. So I am, I'm not in that, like, I feel like I need to invest in something. I need to put it in there right away. I'm in the, I'm building relationships. Um, I'm looking at Zillow or Redfin to see what's out there. I'm not in any rush to, to jump in, but I I'm watching and that's where I would put that money. So when you say real estate, do you have any idea what you'd invest in? Uh, like multifamily, single family or, or apartment complex? What are you thinking? Um, multifamily, small multifamily to start. Uh, I would love to own apartment complexes. I, I think I need to learn a little bit more before I get there. Totally. And I have a ton of real estate experience. I, but my experience is all on, closing deals. It's on how to, how to execute. Once you have that strategy, I've never, I actually, I own my house. So I do own real estate. Now I'm getting a lesson in home ownership, learning the, the various systems like the AC, how that works, the hot water heater, how those things work. Um, so I would start with probably a, a, a duplex to maybe a quad or five units. I'd love to be in that range, get to know that well, and then ultimately start looking at, at bigger things. Love that. It's awesome. Very cool. I'm sure people were just curious. That's why I wanted to know. Right That's it. Uh, cool. So last question, the core four, a little bit deeper here. Um, I'll leave it open-ended to you. What do you want okay. your legacy to be? What are you doing all this for? Why do you get out of bed every morning? Um, 
first of all, my, my number one priority in life is my family. So I, I, I wake up every day, go to work and, and do everything I do to provide for them a good life. Like I have a very deep sense of responsibility for, for my wife, for my kids to keep them comfortable, to pay for their education, to set everybody on, on the best possible path for the future. But personally, I, I love people. I love talking to others and building relationships. That's something that has always been important to me. And so I would want my legacy to be um, that I made people feel good, that people enjoyed spending time with me and um, that I helped them. All throughout my life, my parents have always instilled in me a few things to surround myself with good people and to give back. In high school, I did, I volunteered for a local soup kitchen in college. I worked for my community service office where I ran blood drives and did park sponsorships. And then in law school, and even actually, actually as a practicing lawyer, uh, I did a, a lot of pro bono legal work. I was the 2020 pro bono attorney of the year for uh, an organization called kids in need of defense kind. Oh, wow. Um, and so that's something I, I really want my legacy to be as well that I, I gave back and I helped others who, who needed help. I love that. Yeah. It's, it says a lot wonderfully about said. Um, great. Well, thanks for sharing. Uh, of one more before we get to the last segment of the show, I know you have some fun facts here that, uh, I want to touch on. I believe you were sure. in a couple movies where you cameo, uh, <laughs> give us, let, let the, let the crew know you a little bit. Um, I don't know. Some fun, fun, fun facts about your life, what you've been in. Fun I know facts. you're up in New York for a while. So yeah. Um, okay. Fun fact was in high school, I think I was, I want to say 14, 15, 16, my, um, my uncle tells me about an open casting call for the Sopranos. And so it's in New Jersey. We go, there's like 20,000 people there. I think I'm not, I don't think I'm exaggerating if I'm remembering correctly. It was on the front cover of the New York times the next morning. They had to shut it down. There's so many people there. Long story short, I meet a woman. She tells me to send, I, I don't have a photo or resume or anything. She says, send it to me directly. I wind up getting a small part of the show. So I, I was on two episodes of the Sopranos season three, episodes one and nine. And, um, it was, it was incredible. I got to go to the season three premiere. I got, Oh, actually when I got the role, we were at silver cup studios in, uh, in long Island city in Queens. And we get the part, uh, me and a couple other guys, and we go downstairs to this room. It was like an airplane hangar of a room. And, Slowly but surely, the whole cast for the show starts rolling in. They're like, oh, we're doing a cast reading. You guys are here at the perfect time. I was just like shocked. Yeah. This, the Sopranos, was, I mean, it still is huge. But it's like, huge. It was yeah. huge. huge. Huge, yeah. And like Paulie Walnuts was in that room with me. He just, he started like joking around with us, telling him, you know, this is all a joke. You guys can get out of here now. Like, you didn't get the part. We were laughing. And I had, and if you, if you watch that episode, I had one line and the line was, that food tastes like ass anyway. That was my line. <laughs> Perfect line, dude. <laughs> Got an excellent memory. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, how can you forget that, right? You can't. So I, I, when I read that at that cast reading, the whole room starts laughing. That's great. The whole tastes room like blew up. Yeah, it was great. So that's hilarious. Fun fact. Really Actually, cool. I'll, I'll build on that because it gets better. The, the the ninth episode that I was in, the season season two episode one and nine, in nine. I was, you know, uh, like, sort of like a little behind the scenes, um, AJ Soprano's friends break into a, uh, a, a, a swimming pool and they bust the trophy case and stuff. And actually one of the, uh, one of the girls in that scene was Lady Gaga. She was in that exact scene with me. And if you Google Lady Gaga Sopranos, uh, I'm sorry, Lady Gaga Sopranos, you can watch the clips. If you Google Lady Gaga, Oprah Sopranos, Oprah played that scene on her show. So oh, wow, is this, pre- so this facto, is pre-fame, I've been on right? Oprah. Yeah, pre-fame. Wow, pre-fame. small world. That's yep. cool. That is very really cool. cool. So you have a tie to Oprah, Lady Gaga, and Sopranos. Look Boom. at you, man. There we go. <laughs> the food tastes like ass. <laughs> <Renaissance> <laughs> <here>. <laughs> That's great, dude. Love it. It's, it's really good. <laughs> cool. Well, I uh, appreciate the fun fact. Dude. And the last segment of the show... Last drop. You handed it to me? Yeah. Wow, dude. Thanks. 
Food tastes like ass. Um, that's fun. It's <laughs> good stuff. Did you forget the question? Uh, sorry, yeah. For, okay, here we go. You just end um, it there. Twenty <laughs> year old Ian, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self if you had to go back in time and 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 uh, talk to yourself? Twenty year old me would, it would just be to chill out. It's it's all going to work out. You're going to figure everything out. The the money, the career, girls, like it's it's going to work out. Just enjoy enjoy being young, enjoy your time. Um, when I was 20, I was all stressed out. I just remember being in college. I was actually president of my fraternity in college. Oh, cool. um, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> that, a whole other story. That's for, that's for part two of the podcast. Um, but I was, I was always kind of like stressed out. We were in a lot of debt. Actually the fraternity was in a ton of debt, which we paid off. Um, maybe that actually started my journey, but yeah, I, I would tell myself to, uh, to, to chill out things, things work out. Enjoy being young. Not a lot of people have said that Ian. A lot of people were like, jump on like, oh, I wish I started earlier. I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have been more focused. And I, I appreciate the sentiment to like chill out because I need to chill out at 30. You know what I mean? Like what, put so much, you're only on young yourself. once. Yeah. You're, young you, once. Put so much you're in college one time. Yeah, exactly. So it's a great point. Yeah. Well, Ian, if people love the episode and love what you're about, where can they connect with you, whether that be on social, elsewhere? How can they find you? Social, uh, at Ian Builds Wealth. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, follow me, DM me. I, I respond to all my DMs, so happy to talk to anybody. Awesome. You have a lot of um, free resources and paid resources on your on your Instagram. I saw on your link tree. So some debt payoff stuff, some, uh, I think it's net worth tracking or budget tracking. So yep. a lot of things, if you guys are interested in, uh, interested in paying off debt and the conversation of investing versus paying off, Ian's your guy. So go check him out at Ian Builds Wealth. And Ian, it was an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Same here, guys. Corey Ryan, thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks. 